and welcome to this Yoga Hero Teachers podcast. In this podcast, we'll break down why pricing is so important to your business, which I know seems really obvious, but we need to explore that to cover all bases and to get into the right mindset to be thinking about pricing. We'll then look at three different systems to set pricing for your yoga offering. Systems that are informed and intelligent, rather than just picking a figure out of the sky and hoping for the best, which I think we've all done at some point. And finally, we'll cover what to do if your pricing strategy isn't working, whether that's because you're working too hard or too much, or you feel your attendance could be increased, or you're just not feeling great about teaching yoga at the moment. To get us in the pricing frame of mind, let's look at why it's important to have the right price for your yoga offering. If you overprice, A, you run the risk of nobody coming to your offerings. B, you run the risk of letting people down They have such high expectations from a high price tag that if you don't meet those high expectations, you might leave people disappointed or they might complain or they might um, ask for a refund. And C, with a high price tag, we do also run the risk of perpetuating that very worrying myth or belief that yoga is elitist. Bear that in mind, we'll come back to that in a second. If you underprice, A, you might not generate enough income, so you then have to turn to look into increase attendance at your offerings, which is a bit of a social media black hole. (laughs) Um, Or you have to look at teaching more which is a bit of an energy black hole. So neither of those are very sustainable. B, underpricing can also devalue the trainings that you've done and your skill in teaching yoga. And C, underpricing can actually devalue yoga. Now, I know that that conflicts with my earlier comment that overpricing can perpetuate the belief that yoga is elitist. So to find a middle ground, a fair ground, (laughs) a fair ground, a ground that is fair, I'd like you to bear in mind your offering, your value, your audience, and your intention. So as we go through the different ways that you can set your price in, it's underpinned by a considered strategy, but it's also a price that you can stand by ethically. Okay, so let's crack on. There are three main pricing strategies that we will be looking at in this podcast that you can use either in isolation or a combination of two or a combination of all three. The first one is knowing your customer. The second is conducting a competitor review. And the third is considering all of your costs. So knowing your customer is really obvious. (laughs) If you know your customer, then you know what they can afford to pay or you know what they are prepared to pay and that can help inform your strategy. Of course, we're going to look at this in more detail in a moment. Conducting a competitor review is our second pricing strategy. Assessing what is available that's near you, um, that's similar to you, and looking at their value and their offering compared to yours. The third pricing strategy is to consider all of your costs 
and price in a way that is going to cover <laughs> all of your costs. I know that this sounds really obvious, but in the time that I've been teaching yoga and working with and, and mentoring other new yoga teachers, more often than not, I hear yoga teachers wanting to set their pricing low. And when asked about it, they'll say, well, it's okay. I just won't pay myself very money, very much money. Most yoga teachers are doing this because it's a calling and it is rewarding in so many ways, more than just financially, or maybe not even financially, in some cases, very sadly. Um, and it's really noble, you know, to not pay yourself very much, um, but you have to live. I'm not sure that teaching yoga will make many people into a millionaire. That's not what this podcast is about. And that's not what I think that teaching yoga is about. But I do really passionately believe that yoga teachers need to earn a fair living. So cover all of their costs and have some left over for fun, <laughs> for living, for being happy. And so that's why I've created a worksheet to go alongside this podcast. So if you go to yogahero.co.uk forward slash podcast one, that's the number one, so forward slash podcast one, you'll find there a cash flow forecast. There's four tabs. The first tab is how to use the document. So don't worry, you don't need to remember any of this because it's on the document for you when you have a look at it. But yeah, the first tab is how to use the document. The second tab is a list of ex expenses, like a list of outgoings. And that really is like every possible outgoing that I could think of. And they're split up into personal outgoings and business outgoings. Because the wage, the money that you pay yourself out of your business needs to cover all of your personal outgoings. So you need to consider everything. And that's rent, council tax, TV license, um, car payment, credit card payment, etc, etc, etc. But also things that you might only do once or twice a year, like insure your car or get a haircut or go on holiday. <laughs> OK, so it's making sure that your pricing strategy will cover everything that you need to spend money on. Again, I'll talk about this much more when we get there later on in the episode, but just to let you know that that worksheet is available for you to go and download straight away, uh, yogihero.co.uk forward slash podcast one. Um, yeah, go and have a look and we will get much more into knowing your customer conducting a competitor, competitor review and how you consider all of your costs right now. <laughs> the first pricing strategy that we're looking at is knowing your customer. The more that you know your customer, the more you'll know what they need from you and what they can afford to pay or what they are prepared to pay for it. This is so critical for your pricing strategy. If your customers are students and they are completely skinned <laughs> and you set your pricing strategy so that your cheapest class is £15, they're just not going to come. Or it's very, very unlikely that they'll come or that they'll be able to come very often. Whereas if your audience is baby boomers whose children have left home, they're probably grandparents now, um, pensions freed up, houses paid for, etc. Usually baby, boon baby boomers sorry, have a bit more liquid cash available then it's more likely that paying £15 for a class, especially a great class that's aimed at them, 
um, is going to get more traction. Getting to know your customer is a podcast in and of itself, absolutely. And that's something that we'll do sooner rather than later. But in the short term, maybe you would like to create a little survey. So you can use something like SurveyMonkey or um, Google Drive has a form function. And ask your audience, ask your following, ask your customers a few questions about themselves. Now, my personal recommendation would be to not collect names, um, phone numbers, email addresses, anything like that, but to keep it anonymous and keep it short and sweet as well. People are busy. (laughs) So just getting an idea of your customer's age or age groups gender, locality, price sensitivity. So um, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, And also while you're interacting with them, learning what they're looking for, what they're looking to gain from their yoga practice. And that might give you some ideas for future classes and workshops and things to hold for your audience. So just coming back to price sensitivity, that's a little bit like your students and then baby boomers example that we just did a moment ago students are really price sensitive even if your class is let's just I'm I'm all of the examples that I'm giving I'm pulling figures out of the air none of them are recommendations for how much your classes should or shouldn't cost but if your class is four pounds <laughs> let's say that will probably get a lot more students than even a class that's five pounds. Students tend to be really, really price sensitive. Um, I mean, so do lots of populations, really. So conducting a little bit of a survey, gathering some data about your audience can be very, very helpful. And in that survey, you might even put in there, what would you prepare, be prepared to pay for a 10 class pass of a yoga class that you really enjoy? And just put some brackets in there. Would you, for 10 classes, would you be prepared to pay up to 50 pounds, 51 to 60 pounds, 61 to 70, 71 to 90, let's say 91 to 120, something like that. And just seeing which, which prices people would be prepared to pay. So our first strategy, our first method of setting prices is to know your customer using gathered research, using gathered data to make informed choices. How much is too much? How much is too little? What is your kind of price bandwidth? And go from there. Conducting a competitive review is something that you should review quite often. A competitive review can be a really in-depth exercise that takes ages that you can do in a spreadsheet that has lots of different columns, etc., Or it can be something as unofficial as just sort of sitting down with a notepad and your phone and having a quick look around. It's really up to you. It's up to you and how much time you have available, how much you're struggling with ideas for your business, how much you're struggling to generate revenue, etc. If you're really struggling, you want to take some serious time sit down, make it really official and look at all of your competitors and the gaps that are available and then you can go and fill those gaps. But if you feel like things are going pretty well with your business, um, then it might just not work out for you to spend time on this at the moment. That might just not make a lot of sense. Okay, so you're the only person that knows that. So Now that you know how kind of seriously you want to take this exercise, um, let's go ahead and have a look at it. So you want to have a think about your competition. I think yoga is really unique in the sense that you might 
not think of your competition as competition because you'll probably think about them as friends or maybe peers maybe they are your yoga teachers maybe they are your inspiration and we're really lucky that we work in an industry where that's the case however this podcast is all about providing resources so that yoga teachers can teach with passion earn a fair living and avoid burnout and With all of those things in mind, we have to look at teaching yoga as running a business. So for all intents and purposes, your competitors are competitors. So how do you conduct a competitor review? The things that you want to consider when you're looking at competitors are Offerings in your locality that are similar to you. So that will become really important when we're back to in-person classes. You want to consider the offerings not in your locality that are similar to you. And that is important when we're teaching online classes, which I think will continue even as studios start to open up. You want to consider what's available across the styles of yoga that you teach. So let's say your favorite yoga style to teach is yin yoga. Looking at what's available within yin yoga around you and then taught by similar people to you. You want to look at the length of people's offerings so the length of classes the length of the workshops the length of the course sessions and then look at whether anyone is offering added extras so maybe getting the recording of an online session for free maybe if you attend an in-person session you get a free prop (laughs) an eye pillow or something maybe attend four classes get your fifth for free maybe buy 10 classes get a free consultation whatever it is are any of your competitors offering any kind of added extras like that note down what offerings you are drawn to because when you compare that with how much you know about your audience, offerings that you are drawn to might be offerings that your audience are also drawn to. And then noting down what skills or talents or the yoga teachers make use of. So things like Reiki, dance, mindfulness, running, office work, etc, etc. So non-yoga skills or non-yoga talents that teachers are combining with their yoga offering. So just a reminder of these, the offerings in your locality that are similar to you, the offerings not in your locality that are similar to you, what's available across the styles of yoga that you like to teach, the length of the sessions, any added extras, what you are drawn to and then any extra skills or talents that other yoga teachers make use of. So once you've noted down competitors and all of these points that we're conducting our review against, you'll have a really good idea of what's available how much they cost and it's also going to show you what gaps are um, there (laughs) for you to fill. So what if you don't know who your competitors are? How do you find that out? Good old Google is going to be your friend here. So Yoga Hero is based in Leeds So if I wanted to look at my competitors, I would look at the offerings in our locality. So yoga in Leeds, and then I'd Google yoga in Yorkshire, yoga in West Yorkshire. The offerings not in your locality that are similar to you. So uh, at Yoga Hero, we have quite a lot of vinyas flow and quite a lot of yin, for example. So I might just Google yin yoga in the UK. 
vinyasa flow yoga in the UK and see what comes up. What's available across the styles of yoga that you teach? So again, quick Google. You can also use hashtags on Instagram. So for example, Lee Yoga is a hashtag on, on Instagram. So I could have a look at that. That would give me a good idea of my competitors. Ask your friends, where do they go to yoga? Have a look in Facebook groups, especially if there's any Facebook groups um, that are specific to yoga teachers, where they teach. Have a look on the Yoga Alliance Professionals website at the different instructors, different teachers that are near you or similar to you. And then check out any events websites that you're aware of, such as events, Eventbrite is really useful. Or for example, in Leeds, we have a website called Leeds Inspired and that has loads of events on that are around in Leeds. So even just Googling events in your area or yoga events in your area, and that will give you, again, a really great idea of all of the different teachers in your locality and all of your different teachers across similar kind of offerings. Once you've built up an idea of all of your competitors or lots and lots of your competitors, what they're offering, how much they're charging and how long those sessions are for, you can start to build up an idea of where you think that you'll sit in the market. So if there's a competitor who is also a physiotherapist, so quite a refined skill, who's offering two hour yin yoga for back care workshops and they're charging £40, but there's also somebody who is offering a sort of standard yin class just yin yoga 60 minutes and they're charging 10 (laughs) pounds then you can decide okay do I charge a little bit less maybe if you're newer you want to gain more experience you want to reach more people you could charge a little less if you have a really great offering that you're really proud of yin and something complimentary and your sessions are 75 minutes long maybe you go down the sort of 15 pounds 20 pounds route okay so laying out a complete view of what's available if there's any added extras how long the sessions are and how much they are will give you a great idea of where you can slot into that. Like I said before, with yoga, we're really lucky in that usually you're not going to be looking at your competition as competition. You're probably going to look at them as friends or peers or people that can inspire you, people that you can go to their classes and enjoy. But because of that, we're really unlikely to be wanting to step on anyone's toes. It might feel like the market is a bit saturated, like there's loads of competition, like there's loads of yoga teachers. So conducting this review, like I keep saying, gives you an idea of the gaps that are available and there will be some gaps. Is your audience being served? Maybe not. If your audience isn't being served, then you can increase your price, assuming that your audience can pay for that because they're not getting that offering somewhere else. You're unique. But if your audience is being very served, if your audience is, let's say, young professionals and there is lots and lots of classes for young professionals, then is there any classes that are one-to-one or one-to-small groups that you could charge a bit more for or is there any classes that are much cheaper where you're earning your income based on volume really based on more people coming to your classes okay 
So take all your competitor in review information, lay it out, identify the gaps, find your home within all of these competitors and get going. Okay, so I think we're doing really well here. We've already had a really good look at how we get to know more about our audience and their view on how much we can charge. And we've got a really good idea of what's already available, what's already on the market and the gaps there in terms of offering, but also the gaps in terms of price or not really gaps in terms of price, but where you can slot in without without stepping on anyone's toes. Now we want to be really sensible and really pragmatic. If you are a full time yoga teacher, you have to earn money. You have to be able to pay your bills and put food on the table and have a bit left over for fun or for a rainy day. It's just non-negotiable. A hungry yoga teacher, a stressed yoga teacher, in my humble view, is just no good to anybody. Sorry. So let's have a look at how you make sure that you are earning a fair living from your yoga teaching. As I mentioned earlier on, we've got our worksheet, our cash flow worksheet. If you go to yogahero.co.uk forward slash podcast one, the number podcast one, then you'll see on there that you can get your own cash flow forecast. In there is a list of all of the outgoings that I could think of. I'm sure it's not exhaustive. I'm sure that you'll have um, some extra outgoings that aren't on that sheet. So please do add them on. You can just be able to copy the sheet or download it. and You've got your very own version there. And then there's a tab for income as well. Okay. Needless to say, if your outgoings are higher than your income, then it's not going very well. (laughs) Sorry. So we need to work these out. Obviously, you can cut down on your outgoings and that might be a sensible thing to do. I think when you see them all laid out, how much it actually sort of costs you to live for a month, then yeah, cutting back on a few bits here and there is, is probably okay and something that you might consider. But of course, we're looking at increasing the income. So looking at your outgoings, totting them all up, let's say, I know that this is probably ridiculous, but let's say that they total £1,000 a month. £1,000 a month. That's what you need to make to keep you alive and well and out of jail (laughs) and paying all your bills. So let's say you teach 10 classes a week. Again, these are just figures out of thin air, no kind of um, recommendation from me. So if you're teaching 10 classes a week, let's say that's 40 classes a month and you need to make a thousand pounds a month. So you need to make 25 pounds per class or an average of 25 pounds per class. So if you know guaranteed full stop, you're going to get five per five people per class, you can charge five pounds per person. But if your outgoings are one thousand five hundred pounds per month, you need thirty seven fifty, thirty seven pounds fifty per class. If you're getting guaranteed five people per class, then it's seven pounds fifty per person. Now. If you're teaching a class where you're not meeting that sort of per class income guideline that we just considered, we just talked about £25 first of all, then £37.50, I don't think that necessarily means that you need to write off that class straight away. That class might have somebody in it who will pay you for a one-to-one. So then you're generating a bit more income. Or if you're newer to teaching yoga, that class, maybe it's at gym, maybe it doesn't, there's a class, it doesn't pay very well, um, as in the per hour rate is quite low and then it's maybe 60 or 90 day payment terms. 
but you're gaining experience and you think you're really loving the class, you're gaining experience, you get feedback from people and you're kind of not doing that with your own audience, you're not doing that with your own people. So maybe you take a hit on that class and try and earn more elsewhere. But you're looking at, first of all, how many classes you're going to teach each week how much income you gain from those classes. So if some are at studios and some are at gyms, then that will be a set rate, I'm sure, or set-ish, so you can budget by it. But then if you teach in a couple of your own classes, I would say err on the side of caution in terms of how many people you think you'll get to each class. Look at your attendance over the last few weeks and just take 10% off it just as a bit of a buffer. How does that add up? How do your classes elsewhere and then for yourself add up? Do you need to teach a couple more classes each week? Like I said in the introduction, that's maybe not sustainable, maybe not amazing. Or do you need to raise your price a little bit and then create a bit of a marketing strategy to get a few more people there? Either way, you want to make sure that the number of classes that you're teaching each week, the number of people that you get to those classes, and how much those people pay add up to keep you alive, well, and out of jail. You can put all of this into your cash flow forecast. And that will tell you how good, bad, or hopefully not ugly things are. And then you can take it from there. Because the next thing that we're going to talk about is what to do if your considered pricing strategy doesn't seem to be working. Let's look at what you can do if you've been through what we've talked about already set your considered pricing strategy and it isn't working. So I guess there's three ways that a pricing strategy doesn't work, if you will. One, you think that your attendance isn't high enough, i.e. you want your attendance at your classes to increase. Two, if you think you're working too much, so teaching too many classes, too many workshops, too many courses, etc. And three, if you're just not feeling great, if you're overtired, a bit burnt out, uninspired, etc. So let's go through these one by one. If you think that attendance at your classes could be increased, Bear in mind that in the not too distant future, we'll do a class about marketing your classes, especially about the giant black hole that is social media. So bear with us, that will appear soon. But for now, let's think about things that you can crack on with straight away. So first of all, you could compare your offering with the research that you've done about your audience. Does it match up or is it not quite right somehow? This is a really obvious example, but just to demonstrate what I mean, if you do your audience research and a lot of your audience are saying that they have office jobs, you can take from that that they're probably maybe nine till five, Monday to Friday. So if you're looking at your Monday 10.30 till 11.30 class and wondering, why is nobody coming? (laughs) Then that's why, because they're all at work. They're all in the office. So go through the information that you've gained from your audience and match that up with your offering, as in what it actually is, when it is, and of course, how much it costs, and just check that it all lines up. Secondly, compare your offering with your competitor review. Are you offering something that's covered somewhere else 
maybe by someone who seemingly has more skill or maybe someone who's offering it from for a lower price or both Do you need to promote your offerings more or promote them in a different way? But again, this is its own episode. Let's not go down this rabbit hole here. You can ask for feedback from A, people who've inquired but not made it to your class. So just a quick email to them or um, something to say, uh, thank you so much for your inquiry. Um, or thank you again for your inquiry. I notice you've not made it to class yet. Could you just possibly hit reply and let me know why that is? B, get feedback from people who've been to your classes but might not have come back. And that might be something as simple as they've gone back to work, their shift pattern has changed, they can't get childcare anymore. You know, it might not mean that they don't like your class, but get their feedback. And C, get feedback from some regulars as well. What do they like about the class? What do they think makes it unique? What do they look forward to each week? And that is something that you can share with people who inquire in the future. And then lastly, could you look at adding something extra to your offering? So maybe a little bit of something for people to take away Um, maybe like a handout or a gift so if you're doing a course and it looks like the attendance for your course is is really not great um could you say anyone that books this week will get a free eye pillow (laughs) or something like that or maybe they can get a handout with the information that you're offering so they don't have to worry about remember everything on the day Maybe if you're offering a workshop or a course, you could add a 15 minute catch up call two weeks after the event just to see how people are getting on and offer your advice to keep them in good habits or something. Okay. If you think you're working too hard, so you're um, teaching too much or you should be teaching less, have a think about what extra you can do with the hours that you're already teaching. Maybe you could record them and sell the recordings. Or maybe you could put the recordings on YouTube. Maybe you could promote your other offerings within those hours that you're already teaching. Maybe it's time to look just maybe temporarily it's time to look at teaching less yoga and earning the deficit of income using other skills especially if you burn out or a bit uninspired or you've been teaching loads of yoga recently sometimes just taking a step back from it looking at your other skills what else you can do and that might be Um, what you used to do or still do as a career it might be getting a job in a supermarket or waiting on or something Um, but so that you're earning enough money to keep you you know alive well and out of jail (laughs) Um, but that it's not all money generated by you teaching classes so you get a bit of time out and in general have a think about how much you're practicing yoga and meditation. I think quite often when we're focusing on promoting our offering, trying to come up with new offerings, trying to do all of the admin and everything else that comes with being self-employed, it's really easy for the yoga and meditation practice to be the first thing that goes when we're short on time. So ensure that you're practicing and whether that means a class swap with a friend. So you come to my class and I'll come to your class or whether you just go somewhere completely different and pay for a class. Maybe you do a class off YouTube or something. Maybe you literally just roll your mat out, get on your mat and and see what feels right for your body. But ensure that you're practicing every day if you can. And let the practice be your source of inspiration. 
Also, to look after yourself, you could maybe have a think about upskilling. So is there a particular training that you'd like to invest in or is there a particular area of your teaching that you'd like to work on? Having something to look forward to can make those times where it feels like really hard work, it can make those times just be a bit easier or feel a little bit more worthwhile. And then lastly, be present. Notice your thought patterns about teaching. Is there a recurring pattern, excuse me, pattern of feeling nervous? Or if you're lining up to teach a course and the attendance is low, do you notice that you feel resentful? Or maybe something else? So being present, noticing your thought patterns, your samskaras, (laughs) And trying to change any negativity that you've got about teaching so that you look forward to it, you're excited about it, you're passionate about it and that really comes across in your teaching. So well done, Hmm. we've got to the end. Let's have a moment to recap. Before you set about any of this work, you want to get yourself in the pricing frame of mind, thinking about your needs, your audience, your offering, your intention behind teaching. And then setting your prices through knowing your customer and or conducting a competitor review and or considering all of your costs. And if you do all of this work and it still doesn't feel quite right, think about increasing the attendance at your classes. Think about ways that you can reduce how much you teach. And make sure you're looking after yourself. Make sure that you're continuing to practice. Thank you so much for joining us for this first episode of our Yoga Hero Teachers podcast. In the next podcast, we're looking at building confidence in teaching yoga. It's a really, really important episode. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, take care.